Okay, welcome to the AITC, the Johns Hopkins AITC monthly seminar. Um, I am Quincy Samus. I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, and I am an applied gerontologist um, who does a lot of work um, developing um, interventions for people living with dementia and for their caregivers. Um, we, I am joined today as a, um, in a co-presentation with Dr. O. Dr. O, do you want to provide an introduction? Sure. Thank you, uh, Quincy. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Esther O. Oh. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology. I'm a geriatrician uh, with internal medicine background. I'm also the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Memory and Alzheimer's Treatment Center. So my both research and clinical care is focused on uh, providing care for patients who have cognitive impairment, specifically Alzheimer's disease, and of course, um, other related dementias. Excellent. And so both uh, Esther and I are directors of the, um, the AITC Pilot 4A, which is the pilot core that reviews and funds and manages pilots related to um, the development of technologies uh, that are specifically for um, brain health and for um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So today in our webinar, we um, plan to hopefully have a very interactive um, webinar. We really wanna hear from you in terms of, um, of gaps in knowledge, of needs out there that are unmet um, for care or for assessment that you see, um, and also ideas for what kinds of technology um, and uh, solutions um, could be potentially um, uh, addressing those needs going forward in the future. And so to start off, what we thought we would do is kind of provide a, a larger kind of broad contextual view of some of the key issues um, in uh, considering the development of technology to, um, to assist with dementia and, and brain health. And we're gonna kind of start from the beginning in terms of what the needs are, because one of the things that we've seen um, in um, all of the pilot cycles that have um, gone through is kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of sometimes we see um, tools that are, that are not being fit to the problem, but instead the other way around, problems being fit to the tools that exist. And so what we really wanna do is kind of anchor ourselves in the reality of what people um, living with dementia and their caregivers and people at risk for dementia, uh, what, what, what problems they're facing so that we can really think from that perspective when we talk about technology. All right, so, and in this webinar, um, I can't see who has joined, but if you raise your hand, um, we will unmute you and we really encourage you to at any time during this talk to ask questions, to provide some feedback either by un uh, raising your hand and getting unmuted or through the chat. And um, we will um, hopefully have as interactive a discussion as possible. So again, we're gonna describe the need and rationale for improving diagnosis and care for people. Um, we're gonna talk about specifically the Johns Hopkins AITC Center and the types of pilots that we have funded already. We have a hand raised here, I think. We're gonna wait, yeah. Unmuted. Okay. Megan, you should be unmuted. I don't know. Well, while we figure that out, I'm gonna, go yeah, I'm gonna continue. So we're gonna talk about the, the portfolio that we have currently for the pilots that we funded. And then we're gonna talk about just kind of brainstorm together some key areas and opportunities for the application of um, technology in the context of dementia going forward. Um, and uh, we really wanna hear from your perspective um, unique challenges and considerations that you're seeing. And we're also going to talk to you about um, what we've kind of typically seen in research related to um, developing solutions and interventions um, so far to kind of help you um, as you think through uh, your uh, projects and your work in this field. So just an overview, this um, technology center um, came to be in 2021 after getting a five-year grant from NIA. It's one of three different centers um, in the U.S. that's funded through this mechanism. And all of this is really to promote um, the merging and assimilation of different 
disciplines, including medicine, engineering, technology, uh, business, all to advance innovations that keep people healthier for longer and that improve health of older adults and um, specifically help them live independently for longer, as well as specifically targeting um, very vulnerable populations, such as those who are living with um, uh, cognitive impairment um, and dementia. So um, this is uh, the pilot award. So um, many of you may have actually applied for the letter of intent for this current cycle of pilot projects. And if you, um, some of you may have been selected to move on to round two, which is submission of a full uh, pilot application. Um, to any of those um, three centers that I mentioned. Um, and so those will um, be considered uh, in the next couple of months. Um, and you'll get a lot of feedback from each of the centers in terms of the study design um, that you're proposing as well as the, the um, problem. There will be other um, cycles um, and calls for proposals in the future um, after this cycle. Um, so if you don't have a project in the pipeline now, um, please, you know, don't be discouraged. There will be other opportunities going forward. Um, so this is just a very uh, basic, well, it's not basic, I guess, but this is a schematic that kind of identifies the areas of emphasis um, for our pilot proposals. Um, and they're broadly kind of um, segregated into diagnostics and assessment te um, technologies. So these are really focusing on um, detecting cognitive impairment through a whole neat, uh, range of means, biomarkers and digital biomarkers, um, detection of frailty, et cetera. Um, and then patient care and engagement. So this is once someone um, is identified as having uh, a need, um, how can we personalize the treatment plans, for example? How can we optimize aging and resiliency? How can we optimize um, function and ADL function and nutrition, um, social engagement, quality of life? Um, what are the technologies that we can use around that? Um, we also focus on, um, on developing and disseminating technologies that relate to uh, improving uh, informal caregiver health and um, in equipping them uh, to be able to, um, uh, to support um, people who need support, as well as formal um, uh, workforce capacity. So, um, so platforms that um, help train um, staff members and clinicians in terms of very specific procedures or, um, or uh, monitoring of patient panels. So kind of from uh, the caregiver uh, workforce perspective. Um, and then the fourth major group of, um, of projects that we support are those that are um, population health and system management and, and administration of, um, of healthcare delivery. And so these could be kind of population health managing platforms or uh, risk algorithms that help identify people who, for example, might be at higher risk for um, having uh, certain types of hospitalizations, like over, a, you know, kind of a time horizon. Um, they also could be related to um, helping maximize and optimize clinical workflows for, for healthcare teams and delivering um, healthcare, um, as well as detecting kind of disparities within the healthcare system of some people receiving more or less access to certain types of um, care. So these are, you know, it's so all of this you know, are supported by machine learning, AI, you know, robotics, big data analytics, and all kinds of other things, uh, you know, uh, 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 natural language processing, et cetera, biomarkers. Um, and uh, in terms of kind of why this exists, like just to kind of take a step back into the context, um, obviously um, we have an aging uh, population, not just in the U.S., but also globally. And uh, specifically in the U.S., the nation uh, is becoming more diverse as it becomes a bigger population with um, Hispanic, Asian, and Black um, and African American populations increasing. Um, and many of these folks um, uh, will experience multiple chronic conditions, including the development of dementia and cognitive impairment as um, they age. Um, and we really need to, as a healthcare system in the U.S., focus on uh, improving the coordination of care, the integration of care, 
and also the um, how well we can help folks transition between different settings of care, um, which is um, really uh, an important factor. One of the things that we wanted to highlight is that it is um, not just medical factors, obviously, that impact health in aging. And um, there is an increasing um, appreciation of the social determinants of health across the lifespan that are really um, important um, in terms of, um, of risk factors for developing chronic diseases over time. And one of the things that we wanted to kind of point out is that those could potentially be uh, targets for um, AI and technology solutions to address some of those um, some of those uh, factors across the lifespan that are contributing to uh, poor health and aging as we go forward. Now, specifically talking about AD, um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, it's really a worldwide crisis. Um, there's over 55 million people estimated in 2020 um, who are living with dementia, more than 6 million people in the U.S. by estimates from the Alzheimer's Association. And this number is doubling or is expected to double even in the context of these newly released FDA approved treatments um, for dementia. And I think that Esther um, will talk about that um, a little bit later as we kind of look at how the landscape for treatment and care has been changing um, recently. Um, but there's still projected to be a lot of people who are gonna have it. It's really um, uh, costly, obviously, um, and the costs are not just medical costs, but also um, informal kind of out-of-pocket spending that families are making, as well as social costs for um, social services and other types of um, long-term uh, uh, services in home and community-based settings that people are receiving, such as nutrition, transportation, um, day center um, use, and things like that. What is not usually talked about is the fact that um, despite high prevalence rates of people living with dementia in residential settings, like nursing home settings and assisted living settings, the truth is, is that most people who are living with dementia are actually being cared for at home, in the in, 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 uh, not in residential care settings. And so that's why one of the reasons why um, that paired with the fact that most people want to stay in their homes for as long as possible, that um, really uh, is a huge um, uh, thrust of, uh, of services from, for example, the CMS uh, perspective to help people live independently in their home for as long as possible and keep people out of the um, out of these more costly, um, higher level of care settings. So keeping people at home is definitely a priority. Um, as you probably know, like many people who have dementia are not diagnosed um, yet. And some estimates suggest that only 20 to 50% of um, dementias are recognized uh, in people who have them um, wor worldwide. Um, we also know that people of color, women, and those in poverty experience disproportionate um, incidence rates of dementia, as well as health disparities if they have dementia. And this really just gives kind of like a general um, overall sense of where the projected um, increases in dementia cases are going to be happening across the world. And you can see in the Americas, uh, which includes Central and South America, um, there's expected to be about a 20 minute, 20, 20 million um, uh, person increase um, from 2015 to 2050. And the other large area of growth, I mean, there's growth across the board, but the other large area of growth is going to be uh, projected in Asia, going from 22.9 million in 2015 to about 67 million in 2050. So we need to really develop technologies here in the U.S., certainly, but we also need to develop cost-efficient and scalable technologies that can be targeting many of these other um, regions and areas, many of which are low and middle income countries. And so we need to be very cognizant of that as we kind of develop um, these technologies. Um, just this, I'm sure you all know this, but you know, in addition to the costs um, of dementia, dementia is also associated with poor quality of life, serious behavioral problems that often uh, necessitate uh, you know, that often lead to caregiver burden and sometimes necessitate um, 
placement in nursing homes. Um, also medical complications, um, UTIs, infections, falls that all kind of may put people at risk for hospitalizations, which then lead to kind of a cascade of, of uh, events that happen that are not good for people's um, outcomes, um, uh, including longer stays in hospitals, risk of readmissions and in institutionalizations. And then of course, you know, there are, ben you know, care caregivers do report um, positive uh, things that come out of caregiving, but but we also know that it can have negative consequences for caregivers, um, for their physical health, for their emotional health, um, for their social health, and their financial um, health as well. So these are the these are the problems that we're trying to address. Now, research has shown us that there is um, there is hope. Okay, and um, some of the research that has been coming out of uh, from global um, uh, evaluations that kind of pull together different types of um, epidemiological studies and observational studies um, has shown that, you know, across the life course, there's a number of risk factors that um, contribute to the incidence of getting dementia later in life. And these are the modified, the potentially modifiable risk factors um, that are shown here in this graph. And there are things like, you know, better education in early life, um, addressing hearing loss, um, you know, addressing uh, traumatic brain injury and hypertension management, um, uh, monitoring alcohol use and obesity in middle life. And then in later life, smoking, depression, socialization, physical activity, air pollution, diabetes management, all of these things have been shown consistently in many of the um, studies. Um, that, you know, kind of contribute to the risk of dementia. And so if you put all of those together, it's estimated that we can potentially modify 40% of the risk um, for having dementia in later life. Um, and this is hopeful because we can target, you know, interventions and um, solutions um, to address some of these things. Um, and um, and so I did, did want to point out that um, here again, like we see that there are definitely health inequities that, that are for people with less education, women, those living in poverty, people of color, people who are living in rural or lower resourced areas, and also many more um, uh, people, of, you know, who are social, socially isolated or LGBTQ+. Um, all of these um, are factors that are associated with health disparities. And again, those things are also potential targets for developing um, technology solutions to address these huge population health needs that we see. And so, you know, some of the, you know, uh, Esther is going to talk about some of the diagnostic um, and treatment uh, changes that have been coming. But some of the, you know, some of the challenges just generally are um, that many of the times people believe that what they're experiencing or what their loved ones are experiencing are symptoms of normal aging versus symptoms of dementia. And there is definitely this stigma and secrecy uh, around dementia, which makes it harder to detect and harder to uh, treat earlier. Um, there's also financial barriers with people who are not um, able to access care, as well as language and cultural barriers, um, access to um, certain types of specialists to get, um, to get diagnoses in um, cases that might be more complicated, um, as well as um, in some communities, there's definitely a mistrust of, of healthcare systems and, and um, clinicians. Um, also, there are barriers related to kind of clinicians being sort of um, nihilistic about um, the potential for how, for whether or not diagnosing dementia is actually helpful in, in people's um, trajectory and their outcomes, because they don't, you know, they may not perceive that there's uh, a lot of effective treatments that can, can help, even if somebody is diagnosed with dementia. So they just don't initiate conversations about it or, or make the diagnosis formally. And then also we have, you know, kind of diagnostic tools that are that are not that are blunt that 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 may not be as um, adequate and that also might be um, inequitable in terms of being able to uh, detect 
uh, uh, dementia in certain populations. And so all of these are kind of some challenges. And again, these could potentially be targets for how we develop technologies to address this public health problem as a whole. And um, this just gives a very um, a detailed example of, of literature that shows how there's disparities in care and diagnosis for people who are Black versus people who um, are Hispanic or Latino for older adults. And, um, and in this case, Black and um, Hispanic and Latino older adults compared to um, white um, older adults uh, often have a delayed diagnosis, a misdiagnosis, fewer specialist referrals. And those who are um, recognized, they're less likely to receive and more likely to discontinue in um, dementia medication, such as um, things that have been in the market for quite some time, like Aricept or Namenda. Um, they also experience um, increased antipsychotic use, which has a number of negative um, out potential outcomes um, or adverse events, um, also uh, at increased risk for hospital mortality. And then in later stages, um, they're more likely to reside in nursing homes with lower quality of care. They're less likely to participate in advanced care planning or advanced directives. Um, and they're more likely to have aggressive or more costly care at end of life. So that's just an example of what the literature tells us about, you know, how there are very stark inequities um, in care um, for groups, for um, minority groups. Um, and then this is pretty much the same thing. So I'm not going to go through this in depth. It just kind of talks about how um, people, um, there's differ differences in how people are, receive a mild cognitive um, impairment diagnosis, and then it differences in terms of who gets worked up versus less. Um, so in as I close out this section, like I'm just going to give a very brief description of kind of what we have funded as a center um, related to AI and technology so far, and these really relate to year two and three. We're actually um, we're in year, we funded year three. Um, so we funded 21 pilots um, from years one to three in total that are focused on, um, on dementia. And you can see from these things, we, we definitely have a very nice spread of different types of technologies that, are, that have been funded, as well as a spread of the technology stage of development with most of the pilots being funded uh, uh, looking at evaluation of prototypes in real world conditions um, and um, initial prototype development and beta testing. Um, and then a number of different types of AI technologies have, have been funded, but with the majority, the largest percent, about 47% um, relate to machine learning as the primary technology that's been funded. And then this is just by like outcome user and setting. So the outcomes um, have been really uh, assessment types of um, technologies for you know assessing or detecting cognitive deficits. And then other um, technologies have been related to uh, enhancing mobility and activities of daily living. Um, and then the users have been really a mixture of different people, like some technologies that are directed at older adults uh, directly, and then some for caregivers and social support networks for caregivers. And then some technologies have been uh, re uh, really focused on um, supporting healthcare professionals, systems, and payers. Um, and then uh, most of the pilots that we funded so far, it looks like have been in um, focused on diagnostics. Um, and then treatment and care has been a smaller number, um, as well as uh, prevention has been a smaller number. Um, uh, in most, 52% have been really focused on home and independent living settings, um, but we also have funded residential um, living community settings, ambulatory care, and hospital settings. So this just kind of gives you um, an understanding of what we funded. Um, and these are some of, I don't know why this is out of order, but <laughs> these are just some examples of um, supported projects. And you can see the, 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 the broadness of them. And you can actually go onto our website um, to look at all of the funded projects and all of the funded projects have descriptions um, with them. But these are just some examples. So um, 
Dr. O, I'm sorry I took a long time, um, <laughs> but this is your section. Great. Thank you, Quincy. So um, I'm going to be going over a little bit about what's happening in terms of Alzheimer disease research that is really trying to define Alzheimer disease as a biological entity and a condition um, and more so than clinical uh, in terms of diagnosis. And I would like to go over that with you. So how that's changing how we diagnose Alzheimer disease and how that's really driven by what's available in terms of the latest treatment. Next, please. So just to start off, um, dementia is, you know, if you have a patient who has some cognitive impairment that's impairing function, that's defined as dementia in its, in its simplest terms. As you know, Alzheimer's disease is just a subtype of dementia. Now, I'm not sure many of you uh, would know that we actually, you know, give usually either probable or possible Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And the reason is because initially when Dr. Alzheimer coined a term, uh, well, he didn't, he didn't coin um, the condition as Alzheimer's disease, someone else did later on, but it was a really a pathological diagnosis. So really definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease technically can only be done at the time of autopsy. Next, please. And as you know, uh, the, uh, the one before, please. Uh, so, and the, all the other conditions are referred as ADRD or Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Next, please. So what do I mean by biological diagnosis? So um, Alzheimer's disease is actually very complex, but I'm just going to uh, just talk about two hallmarks, two pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. One is called amyloid protein and the other is tau. Uh, so this is a, a basically a cartoon of what you might see. So amyloid protein is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. You can find it in a soluble form. So it's floating in your cerebral spinal fluid in your blood and eventually accumulates in the brain parenchyma or tissue. And that's on the right-hand side. And tau protein is one of the proteins that are very important for, for keeping the structure of the neurons intact. And we have biomarkers to actually detect these. And these are kind of considered to be surrogate biomarkers of what's happening in the brain. And that's how we are really coming to diagnose Alzheimer's disease uh, now and probably in the future. So biomarkers are already available to, um, in terms of quantifying amyloid protein, cerebral spinal fluid, as well as in blood, which has been a game changer, and what's called amyloid PET scan. And tau protein, also available commercially in cerebral spinal fluid, blood. And we do have tau PET scan, but that's still in research stages. What that means is that as a clinician who's practicing in a memory clinic, more and more, I am relying on biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. And especially now that blood test is available and is covered by commercial insurance as well as Medicare to actually give more enhanced diagnosis or more definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So one example is a blood test that I would order what's called ATM profile. So A stands for amyloid, T stands for tau, N stands for, in this case, uh, what's called neurofilament light, but just an indication of basically neurodegeneration. And with that biomarker, I might have a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and giving uh, a little bit more definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease uh, based on those biomarkers. I still do cerebral spinal fluid and amyloid PET scan is being more used, but why are these becoming more important? Uh, next slide, please. And that is because we now have new treatments for Alzheimer's disease that's actually disease modifying. Now, they don't cure Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show you why that might be. Uh, but one is called lacanamab. Uh, the other one that was just approved uh, was called is called uh, donanamab. They're both basically both monoclonal antibodies that's developed against amyloid peptide or protein in a laboratory and infuse in an IV infusion format to uh, individuals who have positive amyloid finding and clinically meeting Alzheimer's disease criteria. And what this study basically showed was that over 18 month period, people who have mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, as well as early stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, had about 0.45 difference at 18 months of an outcome called CDR sum of boxes. And that's basically a functional state due to your brain function. 
And so um, also interpreted as 27% slowing on the CDR sum of boxes as well. But because this is targeting amyloid, many patients who are coming to my clinic want to talk about these monoclonal antibodies. And therefore, in order to basically make sure that they have the right target, so to speak, for these new therapies, I'm having to order either blood, cerebral spinal fluid, or PET scan, identifying that they have enough amyloid to say that they have um, Alzheimer's disease as de defined by biomarkers. Next, please. The reality is that actually it's more complex. It's something that we don't really talk about even though I might give somebody a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease clinically, and even with using biomarkers, the reality is that most patients in the United States have what's called mixed dementia. So they might be clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a famous study from Rush University where they followed a cohort of um, individuals who volunteered to have basically donate their brain uh, at the time of when they pass away. And what they found was that these were all, you know, basically diagnosed, um, these individuals are all diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, but the autopsy showed that their brain, some of it was Alzheimer's disease pathology, but much of it was also a vascular disease as well as non-Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative disease. And so when you're talking about individuals who are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in their seventies and eighties and nineties, this is actually what's going on in the brain. And so that's the, another reason why probably even though lacanamib and donanamib are targeting amyloid protein, it's not curative because there's so many other things that are going on. Next, please. Okay. And um, Esther, we do have somebody who has a hand raised, uh, Nasmus. Um, I am not sure exactly how to let her um, speak. Yeah, I think uh, Shagla has to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Unmuted. Okay. Nasmus, can you hear us? Yeah, I think. Uh, yes, 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 I can hear it. Oh, I'm writing the same question so that I do not uh, hamper the flow of the Dr. Wu's uh, speech. So, yeah, I'm, I'm writing the same thing. Okay. Question to, uh, and then put uh, to the chat box. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's keep going. Yeah. So next, please. Yeah. So bottom line is that uh, we have monoclonal antibodies targeted against amyloidosis. And technically, even if you wipe out the pure Alzheimer's disease, so to speak, most people have actually mixed pathology and non-AD pathologies only. Okay. Next, please. So what does that mean? I often get approached by um, you know, people who are developing technology for screening for dementia or cognitive impairment, MCI, um, as well as diagnosis. Well, this is a game changer because most often they would say, well, I have this thing you know, where maybe you might be able to talk into the tool and I can give you a diagnosis of MCI or, uh, or dementia based on your speech pattern or uh, whether you can remember the story that was being told to you and having to repeat it back or, or many other iterations of this. Well, that's a kind of a phenotypic or description of what the patient might have, but now, because of the blood biomarkers, especially that is so easy to get, um, I think uh, the tools that you'll have to basically um, develop really needs to be gauged or a benchmark against that. So one is, is your tool a screening or a diagnostic tool? So from technology standpoint, unless you can really identify amyloid protein or maybe in the future tau protein, so to speak, your tool is most likely a screening tool. So there is a difference. And so it could be that you could still make a case saying that, well, uh, those blood tests or cerebral spinal fluid tests or PET scans are still not readily available. And so I have a very simple device that can do a screening. And if need be, they might be able to go to, let's say, a major you know, medical center, get these testing done. But the blood tests are becoming very, very much you know, um, widely um, available now. So we'll see what that happens uh, in terms of you know, technology that can be uh, benchmarked against that. And, you know, so how does your tool compare with what's commercially available? So the bar is a little bit higher than before. And this all happened the next, uh, in the last uh, six, you know, six to 12 months. Um, and how does your tool address, you know, diversity and non-medical factors that influence health outcomes? Dr. You know, um, Sam has talked a lot about SDOH. And why do I mention it? Because a lot of times the tools, you know, um, I think, I attend a lot of conferences and see a lot of um, 
ROC curves uh, with a lot of technology that's being presented and often it falls short. And we think it's because a lot of times the SDOH factors influence that and is not being factored in. This is one of the harder um, actually variables to actually collect if you're looking a large looking at a larger data set or really hoping to mine um, you know electronic health records. A lot of times these are things that are basically missing yet so important in health outcomes. Um, and does your tool address non-amyloid pathology? Uh, the world is kind of focused on amyloid right now, but we also are very cognizant of the fact that vascular etiology is, you know, very, very important. A lot of people are developing MRI tools to kind of really um, delineate vascular risk factors even better than we have been able to do before. So that's another area of potential development. Next, please. So I think, you know, this is all to say is that, you know, what we're trying to do, at least the world is really, really moving to the early pathology of Alzheimer's disease or early manifestations, um, so much so that, you know, we can think of MCI or mild cognitive impairments, pre-dementia, but, you know, a lot of us are talking about preclinical. This is not for treatment purposes at this time, but it's really important to understand that when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, the pathology has been happening for 20, 30 years before it becomes very clinically evident. But I wanna tell you also that now we're gonna go into a section where there's so much need in terms of uh, actually taking care of the patients who already have Alzheimer's disease, whether they're in the mild, moderate, or more severe stages. Next, please. Missy, I think you were gonna, um, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. So this this basically kind of follows on to what Esther was talking about. So um, so beyond the diagnosis, so the diagnosis is really important, obviously to begin um, to, uh, to, to start developing care plans, but this is a very um, wonderful figure that kind of shows the um, potential targets for the developing um, technologies or behavioral approaches um, that kind of rest along the disease trajectory. And so you can see, um, this is from Dr. Laura Gitlin, who's at the um, Drexel University. Um, and, um, and basically this just shows like a lot of the needs, the needs are at the top um, and the needs um, relate to both people living with dementia as well as their family caregivers. Um, and these are some typical types of needs um, that happen along this. And of course, everybody's individual trajectory is going to be much different depending on what, you know, all these other factors, you know, social determinants of health, as well as the type of etiology that they have. But this provides like a great way to envision um, how you can think about developing technologies and interventions to basically um, mediate um, or um, address some of these needs that happen um, along from normal preclinical mild cognitive impairment and kind of risk reduction things um, to the treatment and symptom management and slowing the progression of diseases um, once somebody um, does uh, have a diagnosis of dementia. So this is just a great way to kind of think about um, how you develop um, treatments. Great, thank you. So um, this is just representation of some of the uh, tools that are being developed. Um, and uh, since Dr. Um, Samus already kind of mentioned these, I'm going to uh, skip to the next slide, please. But I think also, um, as uh, Dr. Samus had referred before, you know, just kind of really identifying, you know, what is it that the, uh, the caregivers and the patients themselves really want? Um, many of them want assistance with activities and daily tasks. Companionship, social isolation is a big factor. Of course, monitoring is very important, as well as really receiving education about learning more about Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. Next, please. Um, so I'm going to go through the following slides very quickly so we can have some time left for questions. So caregiving is very costly. Um, a lot of it is unpaid. Um, and there's a lot of caregiving tasks that people need help with. Next, please. A lot of people want uh, companionship. So uh, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of work uh, workforce shortage. So I know there's been some robots that had been developed to really um, uh, kind of address the workforce um, shortage issue. Not really sure if it's panned out, but where it seems to be very promising is in terms of really addressing social isolation and providing companionship. Next, please. Monitoring sensors, so we're really worried about a lot of falls, so assessing fall risks. 
um, you know, actually wandering is another problem. If the patient's uh, uh, not supervised during the daytime, a lot of the children or spouses might go to work. They might need some um, uh, way to really make sure that patients not wander off. Um, you know, this is an example of um, just like where things can be placed uh, in terms of kitchen hazard. I think the reference is somehow taken off this, but there's actually um, a lot of examples of, you know, different places around the kitchen or other areas in the home where sensors and other things can be placed. Next, please. If you ever want to see a really model example of how we should really be taking care of our older adults with dementia, especially in the more advanced year stages, I would really encourage you to look at this example of a nursing call, nursing home called Hogovic in Amsterdam, uh, right outside of Amsterdam. And I think it might give you a lot of ideas about different types of technologies that can be developed. Next, please. A lot of my caregivers want education. Uh, once they leave my clinic, they feel so alone. Um, some of them actually can, you know, belong to a support group, um, but they're not always available in terms of leaving home. Uh, leaving their, uh, you know, loved one unsupervised and going to an in-person support group? You know, is there an opportunity for virtual platform? Um, a lot of digital platform in terms of receiving education, uh, not just, you know, book letter or books. Also care navigator, you know, how do I deal with X, Y, and Z? A lot of the unknown territory as they really uh, move along the um, dementia journey. Next, please. Okay, Chrissy. Okay, thank you. And so, you know, just to kind of wrap up um, this discussion, like what we've tried to show you is, um, is kind of taking it from a public health and a population health and an individual kind of, um, tr you know, kind of perspective for people who are receiving um, and who, who really have needs that relate to, um, to dementia, cognitive impairment, how to reduce risk in people who are who are still cognitive health, cognitively healthy, and to think of you know the different potential target points for developing technologies, and for sure there are so many that could be considered. Um, however, the um, the technology is only going to be as um, effective as um, how well it is um, taken up and adopted and paid for, you know, and how well people um, kind of consumers. Um, see it as something that's addressing a need that's important to them. Um, and so some of the considerations in terms of how to develop research pilots and research projects that are really meant to accelerate um, the development and scaling and adoption of technologies, here are some considerations that we just, you know, kind of generally um, have put together from what we've seen in the literature as well as conversations that we've had. Um, in uh, number one, there's definitely, uh, you know, kind of the idea of evidence-based solutions and evidence-based interventions is really important to payers, um, as well as to um, kind of advancing things, um, uh, you know, through um, scaling. And so many times what we see is not a lot of rigorous research that really kind of um, provides evidence of, of the feasibility of technologies or the acceptability to different types of, um, of end users, um, as well as kind of gaps in what we know about how how effective is it actually in terms of addressing the targeted problem that it's meant to address. And so the whole reason, you know, AITC exists is to increase um, the uh, funding and the rigor of these types of, um, of, of pilot investigations to really try and advance the field to get um, the evidence base stronger um, and really understands like which technologies are going to make, you know, have a high impact. Um, a lot of things have to be taken into account and in, in kind of serve as barriers and considerations, including um, is the technology going to be accessible to all the populations in need? So we've already seen a lot of health disparities that have to do with different types of groups, different types of where people are living, cultural differences, et cetera. We also have to consider costs and whether in scaling, um, it's going to be something that's going to be affordable. Um, so for example, those new FDA approved treatments, like um, you know, the whole idea of working somebody up for eligibility for whether they're even eligible to have those, those, uh, those drug infusions, um, and, and then the actual delivery of infusions and the cost of the drugs, 
uh, is something that we're considering in the U.S., but in lower and middle income countries, like that's not even on the table right now, right? And so, um, so you know, kind of thinking about how technologies can be developed in cost-effective ways uh, is going to be important. And then, of course, like we all know that there's huge privacy considerations and ethical considerations about the use of of data, of large, you know, uh, large data sets and how they're used. And in um, people really are um, uh, uh, not. Um, yeah, like very leery of that, and rightly so. Um, also, the complexity of how to how people are using it. So, for example, if you're developing an AI assistant or AI chatbot, like it seems, uh, you know, you have to really get user input in terms of how they're interacting with it to uh, maximize the um, how it, how it's working and the efficiency. So, again, kind of bringing end users and developers really close together from the very beginning of the pipeline. Um, and then also, you know, kind of um, uh, technologies are being developed in systems uh, like population health systems and things like that. And so, again, you know, there's lots of different applications, but there's also lots of different considerations um, and, uh, in, in, um, you know, in, in how you uh, provide a business model for it in the value propositions. Um, you guys probably, you know, know this better than I do, but um, there are very different value propositions and, um, and uh, you know, kind of return on investment factors that go into things that are going to be, uh, you know, pitched to health systems versus consumers. And I will say, you know, technologies directed at consumers is very tricky because people, again, that stigma of dementia, of people not wanting to uh, be known as having cognitive impairment, um, that is definitely like what I've seen as a barrier for kind of consumer um, consumer marketed um, technologies. And these are just some general kind of research related um, methodological considerations and limitations that we've seen so far um, that in your pilots, in your work to advance the rigorous, you know, kind of development of evidence-based um, solutions. These are just some things to consider. So the, the sample sizes of our pilots, the um, effect sizes that we're looking for, um, how well we characterize the people who are under study. So, you know, there's a big difference, there might be a big difference between people who have dementia of any type versus people who have vascular dementia or um, Alzheimer's disease dementia. Um, so understanding who our sample size is, is really important. And then also like very, you know, kind of um, having more than one study um, that um, shows the same effect of the same intervention in the same population. So we need to replicate more. We also need to have a more um, uh, well thought out um, driver diagrams or some people call them logic models. So what is it about our technology solution or intervention that is going to lead to the, the changes in our targeted outcomes. So thinking through those mechanisms of action um, is also something that we need to um, do a much better job of. And then of course, like cost, like the return on investment data, the cost data that is absolutely needed um, to convince payers to take up um, our interventions and to um, then scale them. And then also fidelity. So, you know, we say that this person used this intervention for six weeks and then, you know, but how much, you know, being able to study how much they actually interacted with, you know, X, Y, and Z um, technology um, is um, we need to report that and to, uh, to be cognizant of that. So um, with that, um, we've kind of reached the end of our um presentation. And we really just wanted to kind of open it up for um, thoughts, comments, reactions, things that you're struggling with, you know, um, and we have some discussion questions here. Um, but I can't see the chat. Um, and I also didn't realize I didn't have my video on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's see. Charler. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. There's a question from Dr. Naismith Jacob, and it's a long question. I, I unmuted him if he wants to ask, please. 
Okay, perfect. Hi, uh, this is uh, Nash Musaki uh, from Kennesaw State University. Now we are working on uh, micro router and AI based fall and wandering detection for ADRD patients, which is particularly crucial for ADRD remote monitoring and can significantly enhance the patient independence and alleviate caregiver burdens. So we envision an mHealth system, we call it safe circle system, as the long-term research vision for ADRD remote monitoring. So would you please uh, discuss the other critical needs for the ADRD remote monitoring, particularly for the uh, from the family caregivers' perspective, so that we can vertically grow our uh, research accordingly. Thank you so much for the nice uh, discussion so far as well. Sure. So I let, I'll take a um, I'll give you a couple of feedback and comments. Um, you know, just related to this um, question. And thank you so much for asking it. So, you know, the first thing um, that I see when I read um, your question is uh, when you talk about patient independence uh, in alleviating caregiver burden. Um, and what, what I would like to know is kind of like how you're operationalizing that because those things are very broad constructs. And that's one of the things that we've found is that <laughs> Um, many uh, people come to us and they have these really great ideas of these very multi-component and complex platforms um, that are really um, kind of um, trying to address a whole range of different things, right? And so one of the things that we try and um, really be try to better understand is if you had to pick one or two operationalized outcomes, like what is it that you're really, you know, trying to um trying to address with your system. Um, and then we kind of like work backwards in terms of, okay, so what are the other critical needs, you, you know, like kind of high prevalence and high impact needs that your system could potentially address. But, you know, so I throw it back to you in terms of what you mean by patient independence. Is that activities of daily living? Is that keeping people at home longer? And what do you mean by caregiver burden? Is that objective caregiver burden, like the number of hours? For now, we on our research only concentrates on the fall and wandering detection in a remote uh, remote monitoring setup. Right. And this is micro router based. So right. which is uh, completely like a privacy aware and uh, privacy preserving. So it's really to basically accurately detect these events, right? So that's Absolutely. like your step Absolutely. one. Yeah. So, you know, so based on that, like, so it's it's wandering and the other one was what? Fall detection, fall because detection. these are prevalent in, among the among the ADRD patients. Exactly. So those two things are, and I'll I'll defer to Doctor O. But those two things, like if I'm thinking of a mechanistic way of thinking of this, like the outcomes that you might be interested in actually measuring to kind of provide some evidence for your platform are number one, you're going to accurately detect when they happen, and you're going to have that data. But number two, you might um, you might uh, reduce ED visits and possibly hospitalizations that are precipitated by falls and wandering events. But um, so that's just like how I think about it. But um, Dr. Okay. Alec. <laughs> Go no, I would, um, I think you're right on Quincy. Um, so definitely a lot of applications, um, it's one device that does everything, um, but, uh, and that will be great. But I think once again, just kind of going back to the, I think the slide before this is uh, you have to be able to demonstrate some hard outcomes uh, first to gauge whether a tool is successful or not. So definitely recommend, even if you have multi-sensory, you know, but the outcomes that we would actually measure in our application would be X, Y, and Z, and then, you know, um, take it from there. Perfect. Oh, thank you so much for your suggestion. Thank you so much. And then any any other uh, comments or even reactions to that? Like, I mean, that's the thing, like we wanna create these things that, you know, address all of these different things. I mean, your other, part of your question was about like unmet needs and critical needs. Like home safety is like one of the biggest needs that we um, find when we do home visits for, for care coordination and care navigation. And it's one of the things that is not usually uncovered through um, 
you know, through uh, typical office visits and care management that's done primarily just from offices. And so that's like one of the really areas of expansion. And so your, you know, your thing that gets the sensors in the home is really important. Yeah. I, I think, think Nicole, have, I think we have another question. Yeah. <laughs> Nicole, I think you're unmuted. Yes. Yes, please feel free to ask your question. You're unmuted. Hi, well, I guess I can uh, jump in. Uh, uh, my name is Daniel Mansour um, and I'm a pharmacist by training and faculty member at University of Maryland. And I wonder if there are any opportunities that you ran, that you ran over um, to prevent falls uh, and wondering before they even happen in the community or in a clinic setting. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually one of the reasons why um, I, you know, I would say as a proponent of kind of comprehensive care management that you, that pe patients get a home visit for a home safety evaluation, because there are, and we, we go, we've gone into homes all over, you're in Maryland, so you're a local person. Like we've gone over 600 different people living in, in, in our region and um, home safety is number one. And it's like fall risk management. So it's like cords, it's like rugs, it's like steps that are not secure. It's like no hand railings in the shower. All of these things are potentially modifiable and you never know about them until you get into the home and you have somebody do a complete walkthrough of the living spaces, just looking for basic things. Like I can't even tell you smoke detector that, you know, that are, have been, the batteries are not in there or, you know, have been removed. Um, that That's another thing, but fall risk, I feel like there are a lot of things that can be done to, to address that. Yeah. Um, if I may just kind of tag onto that. So one thing is, I think, Quincy, one of the things that you had talked about was really understanding the, the mechanism of why things are happening. So home safety is, of course, paramount. You know, you, you, you that's like low hanging fruit to me. Like you should do what you can do and easily. But the other thing is that it's actually the person who has the, the you know, dementia or the neurodegenerative condition. So as a clinician, I might look for maybe vestibular dysfunction, right? That's something that can be actually treated with physical therapy. Um, the other thing would be multi-sensory. So the re one of the reasons why people fall in the uh, back, um, like when, while they're taking a shower is because you close your eyes. Uh, so actually vision, hearing, touch, all those, you know, and then peripheral neuropathy, all of those things actually factor in. So I think definitely those things are also important as well. Uh, you know, from technology standpoint, that might be an interesting thing to kind of approach as well. So it's like, you know, if you think about multisensory, there's the environment, but then there is also the, the person. Yeah, great. Thank you for, for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, do you foresee technology like a wearable device that would uh, uh, screen for all of these, all of these uh, signals before they, they even precipitate a fall? or precipitate a wandering uh, event? Um, I can't remember like one example, but I that sounds familiar to me, which means that among a lot of the applications that Quincy and I have gone through, I think there, there definitely had been wearables as well. So that's a uh, you know common thing that, you know, is actually um, uh, submitted as a potential, you know, pilot project. So, I think, but that kind of speaks to uh, what Dr. Samus was saying, which is if you want to be a standout, you want to really look at, you know, um, what are the outcomes and how, if you have preliminary data, because it is true that a lot of people are working on wearables, a lot of people are working on home sensor monitoring system. And so for you to be a standout, you would really need to kind of focus on one or two outcomes and demonstrate in a preliminary pilot study that, that there's a signal. And since you're a pharmacist, I'll also add that medication administration at home is a huge unmet need. Um, people, you go and do like a brown bag medication review of not just their prescribed medicines, but also their supplements they're taking, their over-the-counter medicines. And you'll see like millions of pill bottles that are out of date or after a discharge home, like no longer in, you know, no longer prescribed. 
And then you'll have them taking all kinds of things that you never knew that they were taking that could be, you know, contraindicated. So the medication part of it too is very, very important. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, oftentimes, again, as a person who works with medications, um, I, I look often for non-pharmacological options rather than pharmacological as a first-line treatment. So, so that's where the question is coming from. But thank you so much for an excellent presentation and answers. Yeah, well, great. And so with that, I think that, you know, we've hit the 12 o'clock hour and we very much appreciate all of your uh, attending this, especially during the summer months. And um, the, the, uh, the you can always contact the Johns Hopkins AITC and maybe somebody could put that in the chat. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you so much.